Welcome, we'll get started. Our presenter is Torkel Sane, who's the founder of Specialist Sterna and is from Denmark. And our panelists today are gonna to be Nina Hernitschek. Wow, Nina, if I butchered that, you're gonna to have to correct me, but Nina is from Germany. Um, we also have panelists Yvonne Wu from China and Dave Caudell from the good old United States. So let's stop our screen share here and I'm gonna hand it over to Thorkel to begin his discussion about international perceptions of autism. Um, and he will also tell you a little bit more about his company, Specialist Sterna, and what they do. Well, thank you, Claire, and um, so nice to, to be here with all of you. Um, I will share my story and of how I got involved in employment for autistic people. And I'll share some of the uh, insights I've gotten from my global work. I'm not an expert in autism, but I'm amongst a lot of uh, self-advocate experts here. So I'm, I'm sure we can have a very good discussion. And my journey started uh, 20 years ago when my youngest son was diagnosed with autism. It was a surprise to my wife and I. We had uh, two older sons and we found that our youngest one was very much like his two older siblings. At least when he was uh, comfortable being at home, playing in his room, being with his uh, family. But in the kindergarten, they saw a different child. We just moved to a new city and uh, we were told from the kindergarten that they liked him, of course, but they struggled to figure him out. He was uh, withdrawing from uh, social interactions. And um, if he could find a swing in the garden and, uh, and keep that, he would be happy. So we were called for a meeting and we were told that he has autism. And um, that was really a surprise. And we had to relate to that as parents. Um, the more we learned about autism, the more people we got to know on the autism spectrum, the more it puzzled me uh, why, are, why are not so many hired? Why is the unemployment rate so high? I was the technical director in an IT company I could benefit a lot from people with good memory, ability to see pattern, uh, high accuracy, um, uh, persistent workers, but also some who came up with ideas that no one else have thought about. It's really hard in the uh, IT industry to find enough people like that. So the more I learned, the more the, the thoughts grew um, why are we spending so much effort training autistic people to behave like non-autistic people so they could get some kind of education or some kind of job? Why don't we change the labor market instead? Um, I thought that was a pretty cool idea. The execution is uh, <laughs> more challenging than coming up with the, the idea. Well, I started uh, Specialist in the back in 2004. Specialist in the Danish for the specialists. The, the generalists had all the favors in the labor market at that time, and we wanted to promote um, uh, inclusion of specialist type of people. So um, I started, and, um, and soon after I got um, bombarded with requests from a lot of countries. I've been contacted by individuals and families from more than 100 countries. So I, I knew that if it worked in Denmark, then it may also work in other countries where the need is even bigger than in Denmark. Because in Denmark, we have some kind of welfare system that is deeper than in man, many other countries. Um, we got attention from the media and we ended up in 2006 as a case study at Harvard Business School. 
And this is really where I thought, wow, uh, I may have gotten into something that could really scale. And uh, when I came back, I set the goal of enabling uh, 1 million jobs, not just for autistic people, but people who face similar challenges, such as people with ADHD, OCD, dyslexia, and so on, who have a lot of talents, but often find it difficult to find the right conditions for their talent to, to flow. We started uh, specialist in, in other countries, and today we have experiences from specialist in operations in 11 countries, from uh, Canada, USA, <clears throat> Brazil, uh, Iceland, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Denmark, Austria, um, and uh, Australia. Uh, so, so in addition to that, we work with global companies in many countries. So. I, I've been um, visiting a number of countries, so I'd like to share some of those findings with you. We also got uh, associated with the United Nations. So um, every year we, we uh, arrange an autism advantage luncheon at the UN headquarters in celebration of the World Autism Awareness Day event. We did the World Autism Awareness Day event in 2015, where the UN suggested that we should introduce the autism advantage as the theme. We brought a lot of employers and, and business professionals. Um, and um, this, I think, was the start of a, a major wave of big employers who started um, on employment programs for autistic uh, persons. Um, we've seen many successes. We've also seen some common struggles all over the world in the way you're being under understood in the workplace by others who may not be as concrete in, in you, their communication as yourself. Um, the difficulty reading, what are the expectations? What is all the things that are not stated clearly? What do they mean? Um, for example, if a CEO sends an email around saying, I have an open door policy. Now, this is what he may say. It does not necessarily mean that you can go and knock on his door and uh, abrupt a meeting with something that you think is important for the CEO. This is just something everyone else knows that if the CEO says, I have an open door policy, anyone can come and visit my office, um, everyone except maybe autistic people would, would maybe know that you don't just do that. <laughs> so what is being said in the workplace is often not directly transferable to what is expected from you. So this can be difficult and it can lead to anxiety. But also I've found that um, there's a high retention rate among autistic employees. There's uh, appreciation of the honesty that they often bring. bring. They are hardworking. Well, when well included in teams, they make teams work better. They make uh, co-workers more engaged. And they also uh, make managers become better managers. This is what we hear from large uh, companies. We know it takes time to get used to a workplace. We know that you need to have a support structure in place. You need to have some alliances built within the workplace, a buddy, a mentor, someone to go to if you have questions, because there'll be a lot of things that are difficult to interpret. The good thing about businesses is that um, businesses are alike around the world. It is the, the culture, the welfare system, the religions that differ and set different conditions around the world. Um, when I started, I, I, an initial thought was, of course, 
if specialists on the works in Denmark, will it works outside Denmark and Scandinavia? Because we have the municipality will fund assessments where you will get to know the individual well. Um, you will be able to work part time, but get a full time job, for example. Uh, so there are some good conditions in the Danish welfare system that you will also find in the Scandinavian and Nordic countries, but maybe not far beyond that. Um, so this was really um, a big question mark. What I've seen is that the concept works because autistic people are about the same all over the world. It's one global family. Businesses are the same, families are in the same situation. Um, there's a lot of people who want to engage, who want to make a difference. And when you are far away from strong welfare systems, um, there's also more freedom to do what you feel is the right thing to do, more than what is described in processes and procedures and, and law. Um, in 2013, I got the chance to go to the US for five years to see if I could get large employers to want to employ autistic people. And to my surprise, it worked pretty well in the US. There's a lot of dedicated people. You're not so used to wait for the welfare system to kick in to solve challenges. There's more a tradition of you need to contribute yourself. And the voc rehab system also worked uh, surprisingly well. Um, what we see in other countries like uh, Brazil, sometimes that's, that's not much a wealth of a welfare system, just to get to work safely, to be able to, um, to, to feed families um, is the first, the basic thing before you can really excel. So safety, uh, basic wealth is the main um, uh, aim there. In the Gulf region in the Middle East, uh, typically you don't talk about autism. It's something yeah, that you hide away. This is what we see in many parts of, of the world. You don't want to be seen as um, kind of family with um, some uh, kids that have a disability or uh, challenged in other ways. In India, the first most important thing is uh, how to get to work in a safe way and return again. In, in Indonesia and Africa and many other places, it's, there's, there's so much stigma. There's not a lot, a lot of knowledge, but it seems like um, it's good to fit in and it's not so good to, uh, to be different. Um, and in all these regions and also in welfare system, it is the individuals, it's families, it's uh, people who have a purpose driven business heart that really makes the differences. And, and this is uh, across geographies and, and welfare systems. And, um, and I think this is super promising in, in particularly in a situation like this where COVID is affecting us all. Um, the COVID has also given us the opportunity all to, to work together more as a global family. We have one thing in common now, besides autism, we also have a joint enemy, the pandemic. Um, and we are getting used to work as a, a global organization which is phenomenal. It's much easier to share, it's much easier to connect. You have to get used to it. And uh, actually the COVID also tips the labor market on its head because suddenly um, what autistic people struggled with to be acceptable in the workplace of like keeping a distance, um, withdraw from big gatherings, uh, sticking closely to, to rules and proce procedures, don't do 
unexpected stuff, plan your work so well that it can be done remotely or part-time and re remotely. I think this is the, the first time in, in history where actually autistic people could be seen as role models for how you should act in a workplace in a health crisis situation like the COVID. So what I hope for is that um, for the next years to come, there will be a higher level of acceptance in the workplace of people who stick to, to these kind of guidelines and rules that uh, comes with COVID. There's a more interest for, um, for, for people who can contribute in, in different ways. Um, so I think this is a, a huge opportunity. We also, be beyond the workplace, we need to figure out how can we uh, get more inclusion into the school system. We hear so many stories from people being employed, how they struggled in, in the school system, very much the same way as many have done in the workplace. Um, but um, um, we are working in Denmark to see how can we introduce uh, uh, inclusion and learning through play. We use Lego Mindstorms robots a lot to create a playful environment where as long as you think you're playing, you are you're forgetting uh, what ha you have been told that you're not good at. You just relax and show more of yourself. And I think this is uh, what we have also found um, works in the labor market. We've introduced Scrum as an agile development framework. We use the Lego Mindstorms to give challenges that should be solved um, through playful environments. At the same time, you learn how to work in teams. And I think this is super important. The skills you share with others are very important because you cannot just get a job and then close the door or, um, or do or work on your own uh, for a very long time. So um, I think I'll, I'll end here and hopefully we'll have a good discussions. And uh, I think it's, it's a very challenging time out there. I see a silver lining in the dark clouds. Um, I see an opportunity to connect more around the world and I think this is what you are doing, Claire and David, with webinars like this. We have so much in common, we have so much more in common than, than what uh, keeps us apart. So thank you. Thank you, Torkel. Um, and I want to give a huge shout out because um, Torkel is our only participant here who's a part of the panel or a presenter who is joining us from abroad. So it's way past work hours where he is, but he decided to come on with us anyway. Um, so we are gonna shift into our panel discussion. Also welcome to the couple of folks who joined us during Torkel's presentation. Um, we have a group on the small side today. It's sort of intimate. So I'm hoping that gives us the opportunity to have lots of great discussion. And um, for anyone who has a question to really be able to dig into that and ask it of anyone and everyone on the panel you wanna hear from. At this point, I would encourage everybody, you can turn your video back on if you want to, um, but it would be awesome if we could keep our mics off when we're not talking. So let's have our panelists introduce each other and it'd be great if you could tell us who you are, um, what country you grew up in, and then what you do now. So let's begin with Nina. So hello, my name is Nina. I'm currently a postdoc in the astronomy department at Vanderbilt University. I'm in the US for four years now. I'm from Germany, where I was born and raised, went to school, decided to attend a computer science college, then worked a while as a software engineer, and then studied physics, did my PhD in astronomy, and then moved to the US to um, take on the postdoc position. This is my second postdoc position now. I would describe myself as a very curious, geeky, and independent person. 
I'm self-diagnosed, so I have no official autism diagnosis, also no other diagnosis. I found, about, uh, found out about autism when I was in my late teenager years. I read about it and I thought this fits very well how I am. My difficulties regarding autism are mostly with social interactions, I often struggle with making new friends, and it's rather hard for me to connect with people in everyday life. Working is quite easy for me in my field. So as I told you, I was working in IT as a software engineer. Now I'm an astronomer, I'm um, working also with students. Um, this is a field I enjoy a lot. And I had never struggled on a workplace. I was never unemployed. And so I'm really happy that I've chosen this field and it also allows me to grow personally. Thank you, Nina. Um, so also thank you for speaking to being self-diagnosed because that's something that uh, at least in this sort of community from the Frist Center, we, we do recognize there are lots of really competent adults who uh, can't afford to go to a doctor for a diagnosis, but recognize those symptoms in themselves and choose to identify with the autism diagnosis. So that is definitely um, something that we're holding very valid in this space. Next, let's hear from Dave about uh, where he's from, what he does, and some of his experience traveling abroad, because that, that is relevant to his understanding of autism around the world. So I'm Dave Caudell. I was uh, diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in 2009 when in my 30s. Obviously, I've been autistic my whole life. Uh, I was born in California and I was raised in Tennessee. So I consider myself a Tennessean because this is I've spent more time here than anywhere else. But in terms of traveling abroad, I have lived in Central America and Honduras. I've lived in Europe and Germany and uh, also hopped around quite a bit throughout the globe when I was uh, in the military. But I am now a, a solid state physicist at Vanderbilt University and I am the Associate Director at the Frist Center for Autism and Innovation. Awesome, thank you, Dave. Um, and finally, as a panelist, because uh, Torko will join our panel as well, but you've been introduced to him. So our last panelist that you have not met yet is Yvonne. And Yvonne, if you could tell us about yourself, that would be great. Uh, hi everyone, um, uh, this is Yvonne, I'm from, um, I was born and raised in, in China. I came to the States for my graduate study in the year of 2011. Um, my major is in genetics, so I'm now graduated from my PhD program and uh, work um, as a genomic scientist uh, at Nash, Nash Bio, Biosciences, which is under uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, I'm officially a diagnosis actually not long ago um, this year. Um, I have plenty of struggles uh, growing up and uh, I'll be happy to share and uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I was invited to this webinar. Thank you. Awesome, thank you Yvonne. Okay, so the first question I have is a pretty simple one, and it's for the people who were born and raised in a different country. So sorry, Dave, um, you will get another question later, I promise. Can you tell me the earliest memory you have of hearing about autism and how people talked about it or what they thought about it at that point in time? And I know for um, Yvonne and Nina, you wouldn't have had a diagnosis probably the first time you heard about it. And for Torkel, you probably didn't know you were going to have a son one day on the spectrum. But whenever you first heard someone mention that in your home country, you know, what what was their perception or understanding of it? Did they seem really informed? Did they seem to view it negatively or positively? Um, if you remember that instance. So whoever would like to jump in and go first. Um, yeah, I could say something about that. So when I heard about it, I was maybe in primary school or so, and um, people talked, okay, there are people with autism. Um, these are people who have no feelings, who are not speaking, who are sitting in a corner. And I thought, this is weird. How would it be to be such a person without feelings? Mm. Yeah, that is a huge misconception. It seems around the world that autistic people somehow lack empathy. And I think we know that instead the truth is more 
um, in the challenge perceiving what the other person is feeling. But once we know what they're feeling, um, because I, I don't know if I said so, but I'm on the spectrum too. Um, but so once we know what somebody's feeling, a lot of times we have a lot of empathy. So anyway, thank you, Nina. Um, Yvonne or Torkel, would you guys like to speak to that? Yes, um, my, uh, my experience was when my son was diagnosed and I was thinking about the only thing I could come across was the, the Rain Man film. And it was kind of scaring to picture our little son who was three years old in a Rain Man-like situation. Um, and I, I met the character behind the Rain Man later on in the US. Uh, his name was Kim Peek. He, he is now dead. And his father at a conference told us that uh, there may be 15 of the same kind as uh, Kim Peek worldwide. Actually, may, may be not even with an autism diagnosis, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but another uh, one. And only one third of the Kim Peek profile was in the Dustin Hoffman character. So the, the irony was that everyone thought they knew autism from the Rayman film, which only represents maybe one third of a global population of 15 and may not even be autism. But the good thing about the Rayman film, when I present it to, to employers, is that they've all, they've all seen the film and there's a positive feeling towards the, the Dustin Hoffman character. We just need to <laughs> change their minds. And I often ask them to forget about Rain Man, but listen to some, <laughs> some people who share their story and not uh, a Hollywood character story. Well, and it's crazy how um, media and what we see in pop culture you know, then you think you know everything about something. And I have met dozens of people who, when I say I'm on the spectrum, they're like, you don't seem like Rain Man. And that's, it's a common misconception. I'm surprised to hear though, that even in other countries, that's immediately what people think of. Um, and I don't know if our attendees here, I don't know if you've heard this quote, but we like to say in the autism advocacy world, if you know one person with autism, you know one person with autism. Just meaning that there's so many other elements of culture and personality and the way you're raised that are going to impact the way that your autism is expressed. So yeah, Rain Man is, um, well, he's one expression, but not all of them. Great. All right. Yvonne, do you have a memory of hearing about autism that you want to share? Yeah. So um, after, after I got diagnosis officially recently, actually, I did some readings uh, in about autism. So I, and then I found the concept of autism, the first person who identified such uh, syndrome, uh, syndromic uh, kids are actually around um, 40s. You know, it's been a long time ago. It's not like, it's, a, it's, it's not, so in the society, in the academia, it's not such a new thing, but I mean, it only comes into the public eyes, I think, thanks to greatly to the Raymond, like some, you know, some media uh, broadcast. But, you know, at that time, when they first identify this group of people, I think we're all under this stereotypical impression that kids don't play with anybody. They, they are in their own world all the time and uh, they, they don't interact with other people. And uh, back then they have a very popular series called Refrigerator Mother Theory. Basically means um, people on the spectrum or they show certain autistic traits is because their mom, their lack of the maternal uh, worms. But it's, you know, it got, um, it got, obviously later it got, you know, debated and, and completely, you know, it's completely wrong because many of these mothers, they also have normal kids. So, but then just reading those histories just makes me wonder like how people's impression like change about a new thing that they don't understand. I think when I was born in the late eighties in China, there's no such thing called autism. 
you know, although the concept here is, is been going on for dozens of years in the Western world, but it, it didn't come into my uh, world until I think um, probably like high school or college is very late. And then, then like the, my impression of autism. So in, chi in Chinese, autism translate into, uh, if I directly translate, it means uh, loner, loner syndrome or self-locking syndrome. So basically you're locked in your own world. And uh, um, so the impression is people on the spectrum, they, they're very stereotypical in that way, like not talk nonverbal, um, no interaction with whoever, you know, whatever. Was, um, and then, so I, I ha also had the, the similar, you know, uh, impression at the beginning. And then I've actually volunteered at a, a facility helping uh, kids with all sorts of disabilities, but mainly uh, intellectual disabilities. And uh, I think many of them are on the spectrum. So during that time, my impression is autism, autistic people, you know, it's, it's more on the, this, severe end. I think that's how society, at least at that time, uh, we uh, see autism, uh, you know, in, in a group of kids or, and, and they, they all believe like, you know, everybody we see on the spectrum are kids. There's no adults, you know, we see in an institute or you never hear, you never see any person on spectrum um, in the public, like self-advocate or anything. So, um, it's, it's really fascinating, like how, like a new concept is so difficult for the public to accept and understand uh, until you actually, you know, you are one of them or your, uh, you, your, 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 you have friends or family members that actually have it. So I, I think um, that that's the thing what our webinar is doing and why I'm, 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 uh, I'm, um, um, I'm willing to speak up. It's just because I think there's lots of things we need to do in order to, to, for the public to know us more. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, so much interesting information there. I'm really surprised to hear that it seems like in China, there wasn't any public discussion about autism until much more recently. Um, and I, I guess that's not, it, there are probably several countries around the world like that who either sort of brushed it under the rug or um, they heard about it, but were like, that could never be my kid. I don't want that to, meet, to be my kid. And so even if it could be, they didn't look into it. And there's also that really common around the world, failure to recognize how wide the spectrum is and that someone who, you know, speaks and goes to college and even lives independently can also be autistic. Um, so I'm definitely seeing some parallels there, which actually brings me to my next question, which is specifically for Dave. Um, I'd love to know with you having traveled and lived in several countries as a military member, what similarities or differences you saw that were the most striking among different countries and their understandings of autism and or neurodiversity? So I, I, I wanna give my perceptions a very important caveat. Uh, so I've, I've always had a hard time understanding why one group of people judges another group of people based on the fact that their skin coloring is a little different or they speak with a slightly different accent. Uh, my face blindness is probably a, a factor in this, but from where I sat when I was growing up and moving through life, every time I looked at people, they all seemed the same. They all seem to, you know, like to laugh and enjoy good food and want to be together and take care of their families. And, and they were so much alike that I had difficulty picking out the, the differences between people. So, you know, when I encounter a human being, regardless of, of what language or culture that that human being comes from, it's not hard for me to see how that human being is just like all the other human beings I've ever met. You know, I, I saw them all as alike. Uh, it, it made it very difficult for me to understand why people would hate on each other and demonize each other and straw man each other so much because it, it, I, 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 didn't, I didn't appreciate or understand why can't they see things the way I do. Um, 
So as a general rule, I treated everyone the same, you know, because they were all so much alike. Uh, and, and, and obviously when I was in the military, I hadn't yet been diagnosed with autism, but when I traveled to other countries, it was a, the, the first time I, I was immersed in a foreign country was in Honduras. And I got along fantastically with the locals there. I had a lot of friendships. We would hang out, they'd invite me to dinner, we would do things together, everyone kind of accepted me. There was a little bit of a language barrier there. My Spanish was awful. Not a lot of the locals there could speak very good English. So it was like, you know, the, there was definitely a language barrier, but beyond that, we could actually communicate quite well. And, and it was the first time in my life that I went into a community and I was accepted for who I was. And that was a profound experience for me. Uh, it was the first time I wasn't constantly getting called out uh, because I said or did something that was considered, you know, not cool, or I didn't react in the appropriate manner or something like that. I mean, it seemed to me like these were the first group of people who just accepted me for who I was. And at the time I, I thought, how weird is it? I have to go to another country before I'm no longer treated as a foreigner. I have to become a foreigner before I get accepted in that community. That was just such a bizarre, you know, and I, and at the time I thought, oh, it's just because Honduras must have this really enlightened, awesome, advanced social perspective or something like that. But I experienced the same thing in other countries as well. It wasn't until I got my di autism diagnosis and I looked back that I started to kind of understand what was going on. If I walk into a group of people that look like me and sound like me, then the standard for my behavior is like really, really high. And my social camouflage our masking is really good, but it's not perfect. Invariably, I'm going to slip up and make a mistake. I'm going to make a mistake where if I had been in the neuromajority, if I'd been a normal person and made that mistake, the only way a normal person can make a mistake like that is if they're trying to hurt your feelings or if they're trying to be a jerk or if they're an unfeeling monster and they don't care about you. And then people would very quickly negatively respond in that regards. But if I go to a foreign country where they see that I'm a foreigner and they assume my ways are different than theirs. And some of my mannerisms are gonna be weird or unusual. When, some, when I slip, they're, they're more patient. They're more accepting of, of, of my shortcomings. And if they look past my little mistakes, they find someone who looks at them as equals, who treats them with respect, and, and, and genuinely wants them to be happy and wants to get along. And, 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 and I, have, I have of yet to encounter another culture that doesn't respond warmly to that. Like I said, all human beings are the same. And if you approach a human being and you treat them like they have value, they tend to open their arms and accept you into, your, into their lives and, it, and incorporate you into their groups. And, and I, haven't, I, I, haven't, I haven't found the counter to that yet, which only reinforces my, my stereotype that all human beings are, are much more alike than they tend to think. So Dave, yeah, I, I have a I have a comment, if I may. Please. So um, one employer that I was uh, working with, uh, we were discussing where in the organization would it be best to start up with an um, inclusive uh, employment program for autistic people, and he said, "Well, um, I have this manager. This he's working with a lot of foreigners, so." Uh, we agreed that he could be a good starting point because if you work with foreigners, like in the US, if you are, have a team, there's someone coming in from Southeast Asia, there may be one from Denmark, one from Germany, one from Brazil, and then the, um, the Americans, of course, you know that they represent different business profiles. You know that the American may yell if there was something <laughs> not not good enough uh, the dane and the german they may like to be a bit more reserved and maybe stick to uh, the processes the, the the person from southeast asia um you you should make sure to to ask if if expect if expectations are understood and if everything is, is uh, comfortable and and so on because they may not say you 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 may need to to ask them and this th this could be a blend one one way to maybe you could also look at um, uh, individuals on the spectrum is how much 
percentage German, how much percentage Southeast Asian, how much percentage uh, American is a combination to understand this individual. But it worked and a good place to, to start the employment programs where autistic people are included could be in departments that are used to working with many foreigners. Wow, I'd never thought about it like that, but I could see that being useful. Um, sort of interesting to think that there are autistic traits that really reflect cultural traits from around the world. Um, so you could sort of piece that together and, and come up with an autistic profile. Um, okay, well, so the last question I'm gonna ask before we switch to audience questions is, um, specifically for the people who are not from the US. So again, sorry, Dave, but if you have a thought from a country you visited, you're welcome to give it. If you could see one thing change about the perception of autism in your home country, what is the biggest thing that you would want people to understand that they just don't right now? Yeah, um, I can say something on that. So in Germany, I saw that there are often very low expectations on people with autism. It's more a weakness-based approach and it's quite common to say people should work on their weaknesses and while doing so, they should have to accept to give up their strengths. For example, someone is put on a school with a lower academic level because he should learn how to perform better socially, but it usually it doesn't work out. And then they end up in a school that uh, where they cannot fully uh, fully live their um, academic level that they are able to do. So I would like to uh, look uh, to make people looking more on everybody has their talents and has also their weaknesses. And that is quite often very helpful to work more with their talents to overcome difficulties. For example, I'm an astronomer and I'm also doing software engineering and this is something where I perform very well. This is something that helps me to get a good self-esteem. It also helps me to get proper social interactions. And while doing so, I was able, for example, to overcome difficulties. Now I'm talking in front of people. Now I'm traveling. Now I'm easier with getting along with different situations. Also my everyday life has improved a lot. So I would really make people think more about a strengths-based approach. Absolutely. Well, and that's the whole idea of neurodiversity that we've really been trying to share with people, you know, from the Frist Center. And we've worked a lot with folks in Tennessee or in the U.S. usually, but we'd like to see that change around the world. So thank you, Nina. Great, great thing to um, hopefully push into the German culture one day. Um, okay. Yvonne, Torkel, would either of you like to share something you want to see changing your home country? Well, I, I can say that uh, I've seen a big, big change uh, internationally over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, the companies are, are uh, recruiting uh, autistic people because they need talent. So now it's a talent acquisition. Um, and not a charity project. And, and not so much a CSR or, or charities who uh, do good um, uh, task. And also not just uh, talking about autistic people, but uh, people who are neurodivergent, uh, which I also think is super, super good because it's, it's a problem for many big companies to have employment programs just for a small slice of a population. But as you broaden it out, um, it also kind of, um, it, it removes the focus on kind of the, the, the things that defines you within this autism spectrum disorder uh, category. So um, at, at some point, it just makes sense to talk about the talent um, and what it will take for an individual to make the most use of this talent. And this is the, the language of the businesses they understand talent, they understand the value of people in places where they can excel. So I think we are on a very good track right now. Um, I think in, in countries like in Denmark and Germany, we are old traditional <laughs> countries 
<laughs> it takes time to change a mindset while in other entre uh, other countries uh, without such a long tradition and welfare system thing may go a bit bit faster and i think there's a enormous momentum in the us in particularly at the moment yeah so i'm hearing a common thread there of a focus on strengths um and I'm curious to know, Yvonne, is that the same thing that you would like to see change or is there something else that you think needs to happen first or needs to happen more in China? Yeah, I, I think I agree with both uh, Nina and Cyril uh, uh, Kyo that uh, definitely I, I think, you know, not only for autistic people, I think as individuals uh, serve the society, we should all focus on individual strengths uh, with or without autism or disability. That's how I think the the machine mostly efficiently can can run as a whole. So, but I do want to add, so um, COQ, uh, not only Germany and Denmark, China has more than 5,000 history. You can imagine how old traditional uh, Chinese people are. Um, and uh, it, it, I think as many other aspects that China has started really late, but has developed really fast. So I've talked to people um, from China um, that they have autistic kids or uh, themselves that uh, the society has changed a lot. I've come a long way since the last time I heard about autism in China. And uh, there are many cities now, they even have um, cafeterias or um, organizations like they hire people on the either spectrum or other intellectual disability side that hire them to work for like a coffee shop, for example. It's like a training program, but um, it, 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 it gives a great independence um, back to the individuals um, with limited, uh, with different abilities and, and also their families. So I, I think they have been doing pretty well in terms of helping the, the, the most severe end of the the spectrum, like lots of resource has been poured to help them. But I would, I would love to see a, a big change for like the rest of the, the individuals on the spectrum, for example, super high functioning individuals like me, uh, I can get a job, but the most difficult for me is um, hold a job. Uh, because, you know, during when you're working, like, you know, uh, circle, mentioned that there's lots of incidents that you don't understand your supervisor's uh, instructions or like little things can really make you struggle. So hold, holding on to a full-time job is, is, is a lot of work for people like, like me. So how we can help to, for people who are high end that they, 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 they have a job, but that's not, the, that's not the end of the story. That's the start, that should be the start of the of the of the uh, assistance that how we can help them to encourage them to to uh, to show all their talent without being uh, limited by their difficulties of communication and how we can forgive them forgive forgive their uh, mistakes or you know uh, things they, they they don't do so well because of their disability and like a job coach or a more flexible flexible. Uh, working environment like here, you know, our my employer is helping me to establish a work from home uh, routine for me. Uh, it really helps me a lot. I have the freedom and the dress myself, and uh, if I need it. So I think those type of thing is the things I, I would love to see in China in the future, and uh, so so that we can encourage more and more people not only to find a job but to enjoy their job actually. Absolutely. Um, and I think at the Frist Center, we've changed our language a little bit to go from just talking about jobs for neurodivergent adults to talking about careers for neurodivergent adults. And there's a difference in just having a job and in actually thriving in your workplace and having opportunities for advancement and opportunities to do new things and take on new responsibility. Um, so excellent point. Okay. So we officially have about 20 minutes left. We're gonna go till about 1.15. Um, if anyone has to log off at one, that is no big deal. This will be available online and we'll hope you will check out the rest of it on YouTube in about a week. Um, 
But for right now, we would love to take some audience questions. So whether you put it in the chat box or decide to turn on your camera and mic and give us a wave and ask a question, if you have an inquiry for either um, an individual or just the whole group, now is the time to let us know. I'm not seeing any yet. I know we have several people joining us here who are self-advocates themselves or who already know a lot about autism. Um, and I wonder if we have anybody with us who doesn't know much about autism spectrum disorder or this is some of their first exposure. If anyone wants to share in the chat, whether they are self-advocate or whether they have some experience and work in this field, that too could be um, interesting for our group to talk about. Can I, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, um, so after I learned that this webinar uh, is going to be open to public, I actually um, share a link on our um, working group. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to see my supervisor, Elizabeth Ann, actually is here to support me. So thank you, Elizabeth Ann, to be here. And so I, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity since I think Elizabeth Ann has been working with me for a couple months now. And uh, I would love to hear, like, her opinion about the experience, uh, like, or what kind of resources she thinks would help Employ, employer a lot to work with um, uh, employees on the spectrum. Sorry, Elizabeth, and I put you on the spot. Yes, you totally are. putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, do you want me to go ahead and jump in? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, well, and uh, thank you um, so much for making this open um, to the public. I really appreciate it. Um, I think I want to maybe uh, sort of go along the idea of strengths and individualism. And I think that that's what has um, sort of stood out for me and helped me connect to, okay, how do we, um, how do we make this a uh, truly diverse working environment and taking advantage of every individual's unique talents and uh, so I think that that's, that's the approach that I've taken as Yvonne and I have talked through um, her work and, and contributions um, to, to Nash Bio and the organization. And, um, and so as opposed to yeah, concentrating on how there are, are differences between one individual to the next in the organization. Just really look at everybody as an individual, figure out their talents and how they're gonna best contribute um, to our collaboration and uh, the teamwork that we have to do to, to put together a project or, or a final product um, for our clients. And so that's, that's sort of been, again, my approach. Yvonne, I don't know if you have other more direct questions that you'd like me to um, sort of hit on in, in just, what you were thinking when you asked your question. Yeah, it, it just think about if First Center are gonna offer additional help to uh, employ uh, organization like ours, uh, uh, and any resources or uh, type of support you think would of great uh, help um, yeah, and if I could jump in here, um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your input. And I think it's true that that strengths focus transcends culture. And that's something we want to see everywhere. Um, but if the Frist Center for Autism and Innovation, sort of the, we're the host of this webinar. And if there's something that you wish that we provided to organizations like yours, would it be some sort of special training on autism or would it be access to someone who could answer questions or can you think of something that you can imagine being helpful if you're a supervisor um, looking for help from the Frist Center? Absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll first say, I think that you guys are, are doing a great job. Um, you, uh, I, I guess Dr. Dave has um, been available as a resource for us. We have definitely called on him uh, to, um, 
help educate us and uh, and I guess sort of a uh, yeah, an, an introduction to um, this is this is what it's like to have um, an autistic employee, and these are the things that you all can um, work on to uh, make your culture one <laughs> that that is inclusive um, of uh, of all sort of the the neurodiverse. Um, community. Um, so that's been a great resource for us. Um, I think I think that that's really the best place to start. I think also um, I know that in in my um, past working experiences, one thing that we have done has been using um, Gallup's Strength Finders. And um, so that I think is a, a tool that helps identify um, individual strengths and would be a nice complement, I think, to what we're, we're talking about with an inclusive um, uh, company culture. Um, so that, that might be um, sort of a, another, another step or, or resource that, that could, be, could be helpful um, for companies. And I have a suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. First of all, Elizabeth, I, I, I love your philosophy. I love your strategy on identifying individual strengths and, and, and helping those people get into positions where they can really leverage their strengths. I think that's I think that's that's one of the strengths of diversity, and it's a great way to tackle the concept of diversity. I would say the, the one thing I would add to that, or the one suggestion I would make to add to that would be also to identify the areas that the individual struggles with and then find like an advisor or a partner or someone else that can help them. So someone else where their weakness is this other person's strength. And then that would be their go-to person when they encounter something in their job where their weaknesses are really kind of beating them up and they, and they need some help on that. I think that would, I, I think as an addendum to your strategy, I think that would make it an, an even better overall strategy. Um, yeah, I also want to jump in on that. Um, so I have some, uh, even some decades of uh, work experience. So I started working in software engineering at an age of just 16. And what I found very, very helpful there, it was not a, a special program for autistic people, but it was, was just um, some common thing. Every um, new employee had a mentor. So when struggling with something, regardless what, one had a person to go to and and ask them questions and help them out. It's this would be, I think, especially important for people on a spectrum who struggle with finding a body on their own. Just when starting their job, knowing here is someone you can talk to if you don't know how something works, if you're not 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 sure how to to deal with a situation, just go to them and talk to them. This helped me a lot. So. Uh, I can say during the first three years on job at an age of 16 to 19, my social skills improved a lot. When I was starting working, I was, I was, um, I was working more uh, back office, um, computer administration, mainframe coding and so, and I was, wasn't even daring to answer a phone or something like that. After three years, it was not a problem for me. After three years, I, I, I also had no problem with uh, with going going to an office, finding uh, finding an apartment on my own, uh, something like that. Things I hadn't done uh, three years before. Nina, so, do you think that that type of um, sort of mentor system is more common in the German workforce than it is in the American? Maybe because uh, um, there is more. Um, yeah, um, the the school system is different, so. There are schools um, where you finish at an age of 16 and, or 15 and you cannot enter university, but you can do a three-year college plus training on a job. And this is how typically someone working in Germany as a nurse or at a bank or um, as a car mechanic or um, in, 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 in most jobs, um, people are trained like that and yet then it depends on the company. I would say the company where I was 
was uh, was very good at that because um, they wanted to um, to keep their people. They wanted to um, educate their people at a very high level. But other companies might not be that good. So I, I heard good and bad things about um, how education is going on. But um, yeah, this is some uh, some part of education that's, as far as I know, not existing in this way in, in the US as everybody gets a high school um, diploma. And, and as far as I know, if the high school diploma is good enough, one can enter university. There is no, no um, degree where you finish your school with uh, and you're not able to enter university regardless how good it is. Yeah, in other countries it exists. Vastly different education systems. And it's fascinating <clears throat> to think about how that might affect an autistic student. Yeah, like for, for example, be, you know, you having yeah. fewer opportunities if people notice yeah. the child that yes. you're different. Yes, for example, I was graduating with honors at an age of 15 after grade 10, but it was grade 10 and no, no allowance to enter university despite graduating ahead of class. And this was very disappointing for me because I wanted to, to, to become a researcher, to do something on my own, to be independent. And then I thought, okay, what now, what do we now? And so I was, was really happy that I found this opportunity of this um, computer science college. It's helped me, helped me really a lot because I think if I had to work at this time at a job with customers, for example, at a restaurant or at a hospital, I would have struggled a lot. But, but this was, was working out very easily for me. Yeah. Um, well, and since I'm not seeing any other audience questions, which you guys are still allowed to throw in the chat if you'd like to, um, I will say, if anyone has anything else they want to add about autistic students and the education system in your home country, that might be an interesting perspective for us to hear about as well. I can share that the, um, my experience with our son, we moved to the U.S. for five years. It's actually, uh, it was surprisingly good because the American school structure compared with the Danish one is very much based on uh, tests and it's always <laughs> quite obvious what is expected from you and then there are test and test and test and test so he always knew where he was kind of and what were the expectations when we came back to Denmark uh, he should take supplementary courses and um, in this case in Denmark it's expected that that you you develop your own descriptions of the problem the problem you want to work on and you form your own teams and uh, and so on that was super super difficult so um, <clears throat> we have created our our own uh, youth education in specialists in, in Denmark um, it's um, one third of the focus is on uh, shared skills, so getting experiences from uh, teamwork, working with others, co-students, go out uh, for lunch, for dinner, to events, socialize in, in a comfortable environment. One third is um, the um, getting job experience. So going into internships at, um, in a network of, of um, employers and make sure that you get the experience from being with at, at least three employers in the internship. And the last one third is about the, the skills, uh, your, your skills as a student, what you should what, what is your interest? What is your ambitions for your study? And then support all the, um, uh, the vocations and educations in that part. We know that if we can build around the motivation, we have a very strong case to add stuff upon. Um, but we also know that a lot of the work need to be done is to prepare as much as possible for the social life as an independent adult, but also as a, a person in the workplace who 
who, who get experience being in, in different settings and not just see job as something you need to achieve and then hold on to, but to something where you can start somewhere and then learn along the way and as everyone else um, develop according to the progress you, you make on the way. I had, I had one comment on the side, but I see that one of our audience members has asked a question. So I'll hold that comment for now so we can tackle that if it eats up our remaining time. All right, guys, I, I said something and realized I was muted. So I'll repeat it. Um, Torkel, I think that's incredibly interesting. Um, and I want to shift gears to this question in the chat because I think um, it's a fascinating one that we didn't touch on at all. And that's what's the approach to autism in young children, so like preschool, under age five in different countries. Um, and if anyone wants to put a response in the chat or speak to it, both of those are acceptable. Nina has given a response in the chat saying um, that in Germany there is therapy and special kindergarten for disabled kids. So if they notice when you're young that you're different, it sounds like you're sort of separated out. Um, yes, and um, this is usually not special for autistic children, but for a diverse group of disabled children. So um, you could imagine this is also arising some problems because because of their disability, some kids are behaving more loud, more extrovert. This is this is totally normal, but for autistic children, it can become hard. Then um, at school, it is quite hard to get accommodations in Germany usually. Um, it is suggested that children, if they need accommodations, they, the parents should overthink if the school is the right thing for them and they should go to a school with a lower academic level, even if they're performing very well. So I had recently a discussion with, with a parent from Germany. Um, the kid is at um, a school called Gymnasium. So this is a school that leads to a university entrance afterwards. Um, he has really good marks, but he is struggling with the classroom noise. It's always noisy, and there yeah, he's about 12 years old, and uh, the teacher suggests he might go to a different school. But he's performing well academically. He just would need uh, some, um, some ear protection, being allowed some uh, going out of the classroom for, for some time, or spending the break alone on its own, but the teacher says he doesn't want to do anything special and if he's not fitting in, he should leave. It's quite often happening. That's really frustrating. Um, and it seems to run counter to the idea that you can, <clears throat> you should focus on what a student or a worker can do instead of yeah. entirely yeah. what they can't. Um, would anyone else like to speak to young children under five? No. Torkel, what age was your son when he was diagnosed? He was uh, three years old. Okay, so you went through that process with him as a young kid. Do you think it's similar to what we have in the U.S., or do you think there's something different about that diagnosis process and treatment for young children? I think it was uh, pretty similar. I think okay. the biggest challenge is that in Denmark, um, um, quality support is available to all in the US. Uh, there's often a, a lot of private solutions, very high quality, uh, but uh, for the general population, it may be difficult to, to get enough support. Um, but I think the, the big discussion in Denmark right now is inclusion or special schools. Uh, we see many, the government, uh, the schools, they want inclusion of autistic and neurodivergent kids in mainstream school classes. But often we see uh, parents fight against it because it's kind of more, more kind of safe for their kid to have, uh, uh, to not to be challenged too much. This is the dynamic in Denmark. And uh, I think all parents, they want as much inclusion as possible because there'll be many more role models and maybe they have 
someone to play with when they get home from school. If it's in special classes, then there are not so many, and it may not be that they can find many role models to, to learn from and to socialize with. I think this is uh, the, um, the frontier in Denmark right now. Uh, everyone would like inclusion, but what will it take to, to do quality inclusion? So um, I think that's, that's the, the battleground uh, right now in Denmark. Yeah, um, it's interesting to hear that you think particularly that early process is similar to the US because you know, Yvonne says in the chat here that China's situation with young children and what they do with you as you enter elementary school is really similar to what Nina talked about in Germany. Um, and that whole discussion about inclusion in an academic setting, I mean, that could be its own webinar for sure. I think there's an important caveat we had to add to this entire discussion, which is the fact that autism awareness, autism perceptions is a very dynamic thing right now. You know, if you look at the U.S. and you talk about the U.S. in the 2020s, it was very different 10 years ago or eight years ago or something. You know, we've changed quite a bit. And, and today's frontier is tomorrow's like established beachhead. You know, uh, when we were invited to China to speak about, you know, autism advocacy, adults on the spectrum, finding meaningful employment, I was very shocked and surprised to hear that, that ch people in China were interested about this. But I was also, I'm always going to say yes. You know, there are different countries have different philosophies, different ways of think doing things. Uh, an individual might look at this thing and think, oh, that's bad. I, I wish the country didn't do that and look at something else and go, well, I wish we did that. A at the end of its day, it comes back to what I was saying originally, which is more often than not, people are alike. You know, the Chinese, the, 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 the Chinese government, as I understand it, you know, when you have a one child policy and you combine that with uh, the fact that the way that they retire there is generally like they stay with their children and then their children support them. And if you have one child and that's your only child and that child can't find a job, that doesn't just hurt the child, it hurts the entire family. So it's, a, it's an issue that the Chinese government, as they became aware of it and started thinking about it, they want to do the right thing for their people. They want to find out how to help these folks as well. And that's why they've started having these conversations. And that's, that's why it wasn't surprising to me when Yvonne said, well, when I was a kid, it was like this, but now I'm talking to people and it's completely different. Like they're forging their own frontiers. And, and maybe they're ahead of us in some ways and maybe they're lagging behind us in some ways. But one of the things I, I love that touches back on one of the first things that Thorkel said is that throughout the world, autism is pretty much the same as, as, as complex and as different as we are from individual to individual. If you develop a plan that helps accommodate and include autistic individuals in one country with very little tweaking, that plan can work for other countries as well. And so as the years continue to pass, I think we'll continue to see more examples of, oh, that's a clever way to do it. Oh, we should do it that way. And hopefully, you know, 20, 30 years from now, hopefully a lot of the problems that our folks are struggling with today are going to become a lot rarer in the future. Well, I think that's an excellent note to wrap this up on.